Aloha and welcome to Hawaii, the state of clean energy. I'm your host, Mitch Yuan. Our underwriter is the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum, and that's a pro program of the Hawaii Natural Energy Institute. And I'm pleased to welcome back for a return engagement. He did such a good job last show. Adam Strubuck, from, uh, he's a graduate assistant at the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum. And we're gonna have another talk story time about bipartisan, and this time about the bipartisan infrastructure law. This uh, law has allocated 550 billion, get that billion dollars, to fund a variety of things that Adam is gonna tell us about. Adam has done the heavy lifting of going through all this legislation and making it easier to find programs that may apply to you, our listeners out there. So uh, after the show, uh, you can always go to the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum webpage where you'll see many more details, but top level stuff. Uh, we're gonna let uh, Adam tell us what, the, what it's all about. So there's gold in them, our hills. Adam, welcome back to the show. Great, thanks for having me back on, Mitch. I had a great time a couple of weeks ago and excited to dive back into the federal policy. I'm glad you do. <laughs> so anyway, uh, let's talk a little bit. How about introducing uh, the uh, the bill itself and tell us what it means. It's gone through a variety of names, but let's just uh, go with the first slide and you can talk about it. Sure. Well, what we're talking about today is the bipartisan infrastructure law, um, also known as the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. This bill was actually passed last year in August of 2021. Um, so since then, we've seen a number of programs get created and actually get off the ground and get running. So it's interesting that we're able to see the effects of where this money is going and uh, what new programs are being created. Uh, that's great. Well, let's uh, throw up the next slide. It's uh, 550 billion with a B. I think I said that in the intro. So let's talk a little bit about this. Right, so this is $550 billion in new federal investment. Uh, and there's three key areas that I wanted to discuss, those being infrastructure, resilience, and transportation. So infrastructure, sorry, infrastructure, we are really talking about our highways, bridges, ports, airports. Uh, and then some not so common things that people think about when they hear infrastructure, such as internet uh, and water access. So there's quite a lot of money allocated to uh, internet for underserved communities here in Hawaii. And I want to point out that uh, down in, in during COVID, there's there are some you know as long as they're not being Oahu centric, like on the Big Island, there are areas that don't have very good if any. Uh, internet availability. So like during COVID, I know down in the Puna area, for example, uh, the kids couldn't get uh, their online training because they didn't get any signal. So uh, the community kind of ad-libbed a little bit and got like trucks to come in with hotspots so that the kids could gather around and uh, and uh, go online and, and get, get some of their lessons. Uh, but nevertheless, this is what, what they need. It's not just the kids, it's also businesses you know, they need to be able to operate. And wouldn't it be great if you could operate from your home in, uh, in Puno? I'm just using that as an example, but there's other black spots out there. And uh, people are, a lot more people are working from home. It's pretty hard to work from home if you don't have any internet connection. And uh, one other thought I had uh, was medical support, like people who have medical conditions. I mean, it's really handy here on Oahu to go online and uh, check out you know your symptoms and all that. But if you don't have an internet, connection, uh, you can't do that. So that makes it harder. It means you have to go into town go to the doctor and, you know, it's a real hassle. So there's many really good um, benefits from improving our uh, internet system. And uh, also, let's not forget cybersecurity now because everybody's trying to attack our, our systems. So let's talk a little bit about resilience, uh, the resilience uh, thing there, Adam. Sure. So resilience. Funding is specifically for floodplain management, uh, FEMA, and like you mentioned, cybersecurity. But there's a lot of different ways in which we use resilience, which we'll get into later. But generally speaking, the funding for resilience is how we back, how we bounce back from emergencies. Um, we're going to see probably more intense storms due to climate change, 
sea level rise. So it's really critical that we have this funding to help adapt and mitigate some of those problems that we're going to encounter. And uh, the next little bullet you had there was the uh, transportation. So what's in this bill for transportation? Right, so primarily in this bill is funding for electric vehicle charging networks. The administration is putting a big focus on creating an electric vehicle charging corridor along major roadways. And hopefully that'll speed our transition to being able to use more electric vehicles, not just for individuals, but for also schools, um, commercial trucking, and a lot of government agencies that have so many vehicles converting those over to EVs and being able to charge them all. Yeah, I recall uh, DBED was uh, quite proactive on this. I give a little shout out to DBED and Margaret Larson. Who's actually, she's gone back to the mainland, but uh, she was responsible for identifying uh, these corridors in Hawaii. And that was uh, like three or four years ago. I recall, you know, we talked about uh, corridors on the big island and also uh, not only just electric vehicles, but also a hydrogen. I had to get a hydrogen plug in there. Uh, also hydrogen corridors. So, uh, Hats off to uh, Margaret. So that means like we're ready to go. Basically, we know what the corridors are, and it'll make it easier uh, for us to uh, get these uh, this infrastructure in place. So let's uh, move on to the next slide, which is like what's in the name, and what. So what is in the name here, uh, Adam? Right. So last last week we talked about the Inflation Reduction Act, which is sort of a very contentious name. I think this bill is a little more aptly named. Uh, but I wanted to point out that it was originally came from the American Jobs Plan, which was put out by President Biden. Um, and there was a bipartisan committee that debated the infrastructure portions of that jobs plan. And after months of negotiating, we finally landed on what was passed as the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. And this has been lumped together with some other authorizing bills to sort of form this bipartisan infrastructure package. Um, so that's sort of what we're referring to when we're talking about the BIL. Um, yeah, and it's interesting to see how the name of a bill can change over time, but a lot of times the content will stay the same. Yeah, really. So let's look at slide four, and it uh, tells us a little bit more about all these bills that got vacuumed up into the uh, top level bill. So how about uh, opening the kimono here on these bills for us, Adam, and tell us what they are. Sure. Well, the first two are very similar, the Surface Transportation Reauthorization Act and the Surface Transportation Investment Act. They both have to do with the Highway Trust Fund, which is run through the Department of Transportation. And those are primarily for uh, servicing, repairing, and expanding our major motorways. Um, but also, there's funding for, like I mentioned, commercial trucking and converting stuff like school buses over to electric and hydrogen. Oh, thanks for that plug. I like that. <laughs> um, next is the Drinking Water and Wastewater Infrastructure Act. This primarily has to do with sewer overflows and stormwater management, which has a lot of implications for climate change as we may see uh, more intense periods of rainfall, uh, more flash flooding, and also more need to uh, purify our drinking water. So this involves protecting forests that act as watersheds and filter our drinking water for us. So one other big issue we have here in Hawaii that, you know, it's kind of, we've been kicking the can down the road for many, many years, and that's cesspools. Like on the big island, I think they have 8,000 cesspools, which is essentially just a hole in the ground where the sewage collects, and that can get into, it does, it gets into the groundwater and the aquifers. And so it's polluting, but it's going to cost a heck of a lot of money uh, to convert those over to uh, proper wastewater facilities. Um, and um, that's why the can gets kicked down the road, because we didn't have the money to do it. So theoretically, if we have uh, this uh, kind of funding becoming available, we can start stop kicking the can down the road and start uh, you know, repairing our infrastructure and getting it right. I think we're under a consent. Uh, agreement or de decree here on Oahu where our major sewage or water or wastewater treatment plants uh, basically are um, throwing, a, you know, they, they treat it up to a certain point, but it goes out in the ocean, but it doesn't mean it doesn't meet the EPA standards. So we've been under that uh, 
uh, sword, a sword of Damocles for a long time. So now here's a chance to really get after it and do something about it. And we'll move on. I had my little thing. Maybe I said something wrong. I'm sure I'll hear about it if I did. But uh, that's my understanding of the situation. And I think this is a great opportunity for us to start getting our infrastructure right. Right. And finally, among those authorizing bills, uh, it's the Energy Infrastructure Act. So this is the major funding towards the Department of Energy. And that includes uh, energy supply chains, carbon capture and storage, and interesting is some ecosystem restoration, um, which kind of ties into the drinking water as well. So there is some overlap among these bills, which is pretty common with federal legislation, uh, but that's because the funding's going to different agencies and sometimes different agencies are doing similar activities. I think in, uh, when we were talking about this show, we talked about critical materials, critical raw materials, uh, I think that's in what what part of that is, is, are we in? Is that in the Energy Infrastructure Act as well? Yeah, so that's a big part of uh, establishing the security of the energy system domestically. Uh, the bill establishes programs to support supply ch chains for clean energy technologies. And part of clean energy technology is these rare earth minerals that are used in batteries. So if we can ensure that the U.S. has a robust uh, production and recycling system for these rare materials, then we'll be that much better off when we go to implement large-scale electric vehicle use. Well, yeah, as we discussed uh, previously, uh, critical raw materials, it's not just hard to find stuff. It's like things like copper and, and uh, tin and all these other uh, metals that we use that are harder and harder to extract. So we have to mine more and more rock to get the uh, actual uh, material out of it. So that means a lot more work, a lot more energy expended, a lot more waste. And of course that drives the cost up. So uh, you know, reading on the internet that you used to be able to find a big boulder that was like solid copper. Now, now you're down to the granular size. And I remember in my previous life, I. I was supporting some of the big mines uh, out in uh, Arizona, and uh, you know I went to the quarry or to the, the mine, and they had these huge piles of uh, crushed rock that had the uh, copper in them, and then they would flow uh, an acid through it to leach the copper out, and then run an electrolyzer to um, you know separate the the uh, copper from the electrolyte or from the acid. Whereas before they didn't have to do that. They, they just, you know, it was just the natural occurring metal. So it's a heck of a issue. And, um, you know, we only have a limited amount of it and it means everything's gonna go up in cost. So it's good that we uh, go after that and, and look at substitution, what other things can we do? And certainly recycling uh, to uh, capture um, the raw materials or, or the, you know, the processed raw materials so we can reuse them. Right, and the better we are at recycling, the less we'll have to, you know, do more mining for these materials. Yeah, so let's go on to uh, slide uh, five, which is uh, talking about resilience itself. So let's let's talk about resilience. What does it mean to start with, Adam? Right, so resilience has been a big theme in both the bipartisan infrastructure law and the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, Resilience has sort of become this buzzword used in planning and policy. I think similar to how the word sustainability has been used over the past few years. Um, I think what's important about discussing resilience and getting drilling down to the real meaning is thinking about both the scale and the context at which it's being used. For example, an individual, community, business, city, or even country could be considered resilient. Um, but resilience is also often discussed in different in different contexts, like infrastructure resilience, energy system resilience, uh, food security resilience, um, and even resilience of human humans to diseases like COVID and communities fighting back against COVID. Yeah, exactly. And uh, you know, part of resilience is trying to identify what your vul vulnerabilities are. So that's the other. The flip side, I think we were discussing that before the show, is you know you have to analyze what what am I vulnerable to? Like, 
a tsunami or a hurricane or whatever. And then how's my infrastructure going to cope with all of that? For example, one of the big topics we had during the legislative briefing earlier this year was about looking at our port security. Because if the port shuts down, we don't have a lot of extra stuff, food, materials uh, to keep our economy going. I think what we have about two weeks supply of food here on the island. So if all of a sudden our, you know, some big storm wipes out a our grid and our ability to uh, offload and onload ships, you know, we're in big trouble. And so we have to uh, address that and have some kind of a plan and backup resilience built into the infrastructure uh, so that we can cope with that. Right, I think when a lot of people consider infrastructure, they just think roads and bridges. But here in Hawaii, what's really important is our ports and airports, because those are what connect us to the global supply chains and keep our economy going. So uh, let's look at the next slide, number six, which talks a little bit more granular about what these elements are, certainly in energy, the energy infrastructure. So uh, tell us about this, Adam. Right, so primarily the Energy Infrastructure Act provides funding to the Department of Energy, the DOE, uh, and it, it will start 60 new Department of Energy programs. So that's a lot of programs. Um, and that's within demonstration, deployment, and R&D. So I'll give an example for the three bullet points. So for reliability and resilience of the grid, there's the Grid Resilience and Innovation Partnership Program which acts to prevent outages and uh, provides grants to states and tribes to improve the resilience of their energy grids. Uh, for the domestic clean energy supply chains, an example program would be the Advanced Clean Energy Manufacturing and Recycling Grant Program. This is like what we talked about, about expanding domestic battery supply chains and recycling rare earth minerals. Um, there's even a new program for establishing a rare earth element demonstration facility. And this is an example of a program that's open for universities to apply to. So it'll be interesting to see who ends up getting a lot of this funding. So how, how can I, I, you talked about three uh, programs. How, how can we get a window on all 60 of these programs? That's a lot of programs to get a handle on. What's the best way to do that, uh, Adam? Right, so the information is available on the Department of Energy website, but we've also sorted it out into different categories on the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum website. So if you're interested in a particular area, say batteries or hydrogen or even resilience, you can find the programs that fit within that context on our website. And just uh, tell us what our website is so everybody knows. Right, so we are the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum, and that is, we're nested within the University of Hawaii at Manoa website. So I believe it's manoa.edu slash H-E-P-F. Great. And uh, I see that uh, Think Tech is right on the ball, and they put up a little flag, and so I'm sure we'll be able to advertise that a lot. But basically, for our audience out there, uh, Adam's done the heavy lifting on sifting through all this information and at the policy forum, we're trying to make it really easy for you to find this stuff so that you don't have to read these huge volumes and try to figure it all out. So we've done a lot of the work for you and, and thanks Adam for, uh, for doing that. So that's your attaboy. So let's uh, go on to the next slide. Seven. Right. So. Like I mentioned earlier, the funding is in the process of being distributed. There's been a good amount that's come to Hawaii since the act passed uh, last year in August. So far we've see, received about $600 million here in Hawaii, but this is the expected funding uh, just based on a formula calculation. Um, so we're supposed to receive 1.5 billion for our roads and bridges, uh, 100 million for internet coverage, and that is in relation to the affordable connectivity program, which I think you were mentioning earlier. Right. And then also funding for public transport and ensuring the resiliency of our ports here in Hawaii. So I expect some of that public transport money to go to battery electric buses and uh, fuel cell electric buses. I've already seen that on the big island 
but where the uh, Mass Transit Agency just won $23 million from the Federal Transit Administration for six uh, new uh, fuel cell buses. And other islands have won uh, money from that same program uh, for battery electric buses. And I think that also means that Oahu uh, also got several buses. I just don't know how many, but that's a real shot in the arm. And uh, it, that's this is a good thing. And so let's go to slide eight. So this is a resource that I wanted to share with viewers. This is from the General Services Administration website. Um, and it's an interactive map where you can see what funding is going to what states. And you can also see where the individual projects are. But I just wanted to show on this slide that Hawaii has received about $600 million. Um, and that really pales to com in comparison to some of the other states like California, Texas, and New York. But part of its population and representation in government. So it's up to Hawaii as sort of a, a small state to advocate for as much funding as possible. And my understanding is this keeps on uh, regenerating itself as new funds become available. So it's not static, correct? That's correct. As new projects are developed and awarded grants and loans from the government, this page is updated with the, the running total. So let's look at uh, the next slide, slide nine. So this is more local, it gets uh, drills down a little bit. So let's talk about this slide. Ed. Right, so these points on the map are locations to where that $600 million is allocated. I also wanted to include the Mariana Islands, Guam and American Samoa. Um, just because at the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum, we do take a Pacific approach. We're not just focused solely on Hawaii. Um, but if you hover over the different projects on the website, you are, you are able to see what they are. And there's also an Excel sheet that you can download and get a full list of the, the projects. I wanted to point out a couple notable ones. If you look at the Big Island, there's four dots on the Big Island, um, both the Hilo and Kona airports, and then also a forest restoration project at Kohala. So the Kohala project runs through the Department of Labor and Natural Resources, the DLNR. And I think it's a really good example of the coordination between state and federal funding because the state was able to allocate some money and then that was used for matching from the federal government. So without the state money, it's hard to get money from the federal government because all these grant programs usually require a matching component. Yeah, it all depends on what the program, how much the match is. Like for the uh, hydrogen hub project is 50%. Uh, but for like the uh, the low no program, that 23 million that the big island got, it's like a 5% match for uh, infrastructure and 10% for the buses. So that's that's perfectly uh, doable. Whereas, uh, you know, 50% is a lot harder if you're going for $400 million and have to cough up $400 million, that's harder much harder, so, and it has to be non-federal money. So, you know, anyway, uh, let's uh, go on to slide 10. We're getting down to our uh, penultimate slide uh, and the ma major takeaways. So we're kind of summarizing now uh, what we've been talking about for the last half hour. So take it away, Adam. Sure, so I think overall the bipartisan infrastructure law is a large investment in our federal transportation and infrastructure. Um, it does sort of raise questions about how the funds are allocated. As we saw, there's sort of a disproportionate allocation among the states. So we're still trying to parse out how that money is being uh, divvied out to states and what the best way for states to claim as much money as possible is. Um, but in conjunction with the recently passed Inflation Reduction Act, the BIL provides a framework for the clean energy transition in Hawaii. It's just really up to communities, businesses, and even individuals to advocate for that money and funding to come to the state. Okay, well, let's uh, throw out the last slide, which uh, tells people how they can, uh, once again, access the uh, Policy Forum webpage so they can uh, get a lot of this information that Adam has been working on. And we're trying to make our uh, website as user friendly as possible. 
And that's Adam yet again. He's a workhorse. He does all of this for us. So he's doing a great job. So anyway, in closing, um, I, we're going to have to leave it there because we're out of time. We breezed through like 29 and a half minutes pretty fast. So you've been watching Hawaii, the state of clean energy on Think Tech Hawaii, and you know, part of the Energy Policy Forum uh, program with Adam Strubuck, uh, who is a graduate assistant, a research assistant with the University of Hawaii's Energy Policy Forum. And today we've been talking story about the bipartisan infrastructure law, and how it will impact Hawaii and you. So we encourage you to visit the Policy Forum website to get the more details. I'm hitting that a lot. Uh, and thank you, Adam, for all your good work. And thanks to our viewers for tuning in. And I'm Mitch Ewan. We'll be back in uh, two weeks with another edition of Hawaii, the stat, uh, State of Clean Energy. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.